Thank you very much for inviting me. Hello, hello. Not many of us are left to tell the story of the Shoah. So I think an obligation, because not too many are around, to share with you so the story still is long now. How many of you, I would like before to I start, how many of you are, if any, Sephardic? The more, I mean, somebody who speaks, descendant of the Jews that were expelled from Spain in 1492. Anybody? One, two, three. Of the three, how many of you speak Sephardic, Latino? Two or later. All right, so I've. All right, let me tell you why I'm asking this question. I'm a Sephardic, and my family was expelled from Spain in 1492 when I can still, I could trace my family all the way to Aragon. And my mother's family went to the Ottoman Empire. At that time, the Sultan invited the expelled Jews to go to the Ottoman Empire, and they settled in a city at that time called Manastir. Today it's called Bitolahan. It's a very, very strong community all over the world. They still maintain their contacts. They have the, the Manastir Lee community in Mexico, and there is a Manastir Lee community in Chile. <laughs> they settled there in 1495. Why do I know that? Because I went to the Jewish cemetery there. And it has a sign, started in 1495. And that place was totally neglected. It was a place to put the garbage there. No Jews left in, in that part of the world, which I'll tell you what it is. And I cleaned up one of the graves. And I found the grave of my grand, grand grandfather. Very old community. The place is called Macedonia. And my family was there for 500 years. And that Macedonian community, had a, there was a Sephardic community, and there was another community. They were called Romanesques. These are the ones that came from the Roman Empire and settled there from the Roman Empire. Very old community. Nobody is there either anymore. All the 7,543 perished. You know, Macedonian community is the only Jewish community. It is a macabre heavy desert. Nobody came back. Nobody came back. They were all taken to Treblinka. Yeah, they are the best. You think? And Mm -hmm. I tried to avoid going to Treblinka to find out what happened to them. We served my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins, the whole extended family. I can tell you now, and then I will read some pieces from my book. Eric, please, we have. I was invited to lecture in Warsaw, so I decided I will have the courage and go to to Blinka to see where my family perished. They were the Jews of northern Greece and Macedonia. This is the Sephardic community of southern Balkan. All of them were sent to Treblinka. I was in Auschwitz just to see what it is. But Treblinka was a different story. In Auschwitz, they put the gases and killed them with the gas. In Treblinka, they did it differently. They took them from the train, that's why nobody survived. You know, the one survived. Right on the train, you know, they settled the building and they released whatever is that gas that you get from a car, you know, from the exhaust from the car. <clears throat> so it was not a gas that kills you, it's the gas that makes you at the beginning, at least, uh, you lose your senses, you lose consciousness. 
and then they were taking them and putting them logs, like logs, on the top of each other, like logs, pouring gasoline on them, and let them burn for days until they all died. That's how I found out my family died. So you probably will ask, how did I survive, how did my parents survive? I'll tell you the end, not now. But I will now to read to you pieces from my book. Some parts of my book, because I think it will be easier for me to read and not get emotions. <laughs> the first part is for the surviving guys here. Peace and honor and respect dominated the atmosphere in our home. I don't recall ever hearing my grandparents argue or even raise their voices. My grandfather, whose name I carry, was a king, and my grandmother, the queen. When I was a child, I would kiss my grandfather's hand each time we sat down to eat, and he would put his hand on my head to bless me. Friday evenings marked the start of the Sabbath. Coming together was our ritual. Those meals were a matter of great pride for the women in my family. My mother would start cooking on Wednesday for the Friday and Saturday gatherings. Invariably during the meal, one of the men would say, Bendichas manos, which in Latino, the Osephatic language means, blessed are the hands that cook this meal. My mother or grandmother would respond, Bendichas bocas, blessed are the mouths that eat it. We ate typical Osephatic food. Every Saturday morning, we had burekas leaves of filo dough, filled with cheese or meat, or my favorite spinach. They were served with a boiled egg, a drop of olive oil, salt and pepper. Or there was pastel de spinaca, spinach pie, served with yogurt and a cup of coffee. That world ended for me on March 11, 1933. Monopor was, was and still is today, the tobacco factory on the warehouse. The Bulgarian fascists, and I will tell you later why Bulgarian, had converted it into a concentration camp. Concentration, not extermination camp. There are two different camps. There are three types of camps. Concentration, labor, and extermination. This was a concentration camp. The idea was to collect the Jews from all across Macedonia into one location and then transport them to labor camps on extermination camps. It was supply chain management at its most efficient. And the Nazis were certainly efficient. Upon arrival, my parents, my grandparents and I Obedient to the officer's commands, entered the building when we, where we were to live. Inside, rows upon rows of horizontal wooden shelves were pushed against the walls where tobacco was normally spread out to dry. The stabs carried the smell of decay. They stretched from floor to ceiling and were spaced three feet apart. Now there was no tobacco. We were the tobacco. Each family was assigned one bunk or wooden slab. It's like my cousin was blind from birth, but could only see her and hear what was happening. It was six, I was five. We were crammed into those tiny cells along with 7,144 other Jews from across Macedonia. My overriding memory from this place 
was that there were, we were constantly hungry. I cried a lot and begged for food. Our only meal served once a day was a white bean soup with a great deal of water and not many beans. The bell would ring and like hungry animals, we would rush through our cells and wait. It took hours to move up the line. And when we finally reached the server, it took just minutes to drink the soup. My grandmother, my nona, spoiled me her portion. She was starving, visibly wasting away. Nevertheless, she would give me her portion. It is equal. That's why we claim. I'm too old anyway, she would whisper, quieting my fears, holding me in a loving embrace. It was a hunger that made me forget where I was and the dangers of that place. One day I noticed what appeared to be goldfish darting around in the water of the little fountain that belonged to the owner of the tobacco factory. Food, I thought. I dashed there to try to catch the fish, but when I reached the fountain, a Bulgarian soldier appeared out of nowhere. He was angry. Without a second thought, he lifted his rifle, rifle butt, and slid me in the face near my left eye. The force of the blow, I was five. Cause I, and by the war end, it was too late to heal the damage. I lost the use of my left eye. Ten days after we had arrived, the order came. More than 2,000 of the prisoners in the camp were to board a train. This was the first shipment. From the little window of the converted warehouse, I saw the Bulgarian soldiers loading my grandparents, Gentil and Luchon Calderon, my aunt Hermosa, my uncle Chaim, Rako, Yosef. Before I could even cry out to them, my father's sister Leah and Hannah filed with their husbands and their children. Kathy was eight, and Moshe was five like me. Basically. All together, 103 of my relatives, the near entirety of my extended family, were herded into the train. I believe that my, be that my beloved Nona, grandmother, knew as she was lifted aboard that cattle car that it was Beth that awaited her and her children. The same children she had stopped from fleeing to America because she didn't want them to be far away from her. I can still see her waving at me from the train. Behind her, leaning over her shoulder, is my uncle Yosef, my uncle Rocco, who used to pull my ears playfully. And beside him, rising on his toes, behind my grandfather. During the war and for years afterward, we had no word from the family. We did not know what happened to them or where they had been sent. I always hoped they would show up one day. Instinctively, from time to time around dusk, I would glance out the window to see if perhaps they were approaching our home for years and years. When the Holocaust Museum was opened in Jerusalem, the archives there told the story, the fate of the Jews of Macedonia, along with the Jews of Trachea in northern Greece, all perished in Treblinka. It was a place I long avoided, the hopes I did not want to know more. It was only in 2011, when I was invited to lecture in Warsaw, Poland, that I made a trip to Treblinka. Being that close, I summoned the courage to face what happened 
and where and when there to recite the Kaddish, the Jewish prayer for the dead of so my grandparents and my uncles, aunts and cousins. For my visit, I discovered how they died. I assumed then that everyone, everyone had been cast, just like in Auschwitz. I was wrong. The Jews were given no food or water during the six-day trip from Skopje, where I was. Many died before reaching the camp. Those still alive were taken immediately from the train to, <coughs> to a gas chamber. But the gas employed at Treblinka was carbon monoxide. Instead of dying, most of the survivors only became unconscious. Still alive, they were removed from the chamber, flipped on the top of the other, each body placed across. One hour, one below it by clocks. Candlelight was poured over all the bodies and ignited. But burned for hours until all were dead. When I visited Treblinka in 2011, the fire pits and the earth around them were still black from ashes. I picked up one pebble. Black from that fire set so many years ago, get it home, I said goodbye to my family forever. Now I'll tell you about my book. How was my family saved? That's an interesting story by itself. At the beginning of the 20th century, the emperor of Spain at the time had a decision, God knows why, to give passports to the Jewish, to the Sephardic Jews that were expelled 500 years ago from Spain, which happened again now. So I don't know any of you know, we could, I have the Spanish passion now. But beginning of the 20th century, they did it too, and then they stopped, and now repeat, they did now again. And the consul, I don't know from where, was it Bulgaria or Serbia, from that part of the world, discovered this Jewish community in Macedonia, in the ghetto, it was called Male, that spoke, spoke 15th century Spanish. I, by the way, still speak it. I'm the last one, unfortunately, after 500 years. I still speak a 15th century Spanish. Why? Because my grandmother did not know any other language. The only language she knew was Sephardic Jewish. And so I had to talk to the Sephardic. We were kept the language for 500 years. The language still. She discovered the Jewish community speaking 15th century Spanish. I mean, he got very excited. And he offered them Spanish passports. Now, unbeknown to me, I just discovered only recently what happened is that there is a kind of a promise, whatever you want to call it, that the Jewish people, the Father Jews made, it's not written anywhere, say, oh, that you will never go back to Spain because of the Inquisition. Never go back to Spain. So all the Jewish community of Skopje and Pristina, by the way, which is part of Kosovo, refused to take the passports. Only 12 families took the passports. Luckily, my family took the passport. But, you know, let me tell you, I'm the only survivor. I'm the only survivor of the 7,413 Jews. My parents died already. We were going to take you to the camp. The Bulgarian said, anybody with a foreign passport, give it to us. We want to check it that they are not forged. Eleven families gave it. Uh, Eleven out of twelve. My father says, I don't give the passport. I don't trust them. He will never see the passport again if I give it. And my mother, I remember, was five years old. I remember everything. By the way, if you want to know more, go to YouTube. And the Israeli television made a documentary because I went back 50 years later to all the places and they made a wonderful movie with a lot of prizes all over. It's called, I Want to Remember, He Wants to Forget. 
I went there. Who is my father? And he says, let's go, let's go. I cannot be here. Let's go, let's go. He said, Daddy, I want to know what happened. Tell me. I don't want to remember. I don't want to remember. He said, but I want to know. So, at the great hour, you see that. <clears throat> so my mother was crying, and she went panicking. Give the passport. They will kill us. Give the passport. He says, no, and insisted, no. And that, that, that had to let us go. So we are the only family who survived. Now it's really interesting to tell you how we survived. Because it's a very interesting story. That's why the book. We, so my mother's family, Calderon, as I tell you, you can trace the family. If anybody reads the Calderon or knows, there are many Calderons. I trace the the family to the beginning of the 14th century, to the first Calderon ever. I know who it was, the first Calderon. And so they settled in the Ottoman Empire. My father's family escaped to Italy. And Italian Jews settled in Italy took names of places. So anybody that you know, his name is Romano. He could be Catholic, but I'm telling you, he's Jew from the 15th century because he took a name of a place. So if you, somebody carries the name of a place, Italian mountain or, or Firenze or whatever, my, my grandmother's name was Venezia. Amen. Whatever. And my, my family took the name of a river in Verona, Adige. That's her name, Adige, Alto Adige. So my name is really Adige. Yeah, when we were moved to South Yugoslavia, which is to Macedonia, it was changed to Adiges. So that's why my name is Adiges, right? This is Adige. <clears throat> so my father was born in Pristina in Kosovo. So he said, let's go to Pristina. And every day we can survive because it was under the Italian regime and the Italians were not so eager to kill Jews like the German were. So we went to Pristina, but now it became very dangerous there too. I didn't know what to do, where to run. And I remember as a child, I remember everything. It is shocking how much we remember. Little children remember, guys. I remember. I remember being hungry there. I was so hungry. They said, I, I, so I took a, a rope, opened it up to parts, and I stood there, tried to sell it, and he said, pretty surely, he says, then maybe I can make some money and bring home some food. I was five years old. And then my father said, let's move to Albania. Let's escape to Albania. You know, that is far away, you know, maybe we can hide there in Albania. And we found a guy to take us over the mountains. And we went to Albania. But, you know, he had no money. So my father went to work, carrying bags in some store just for food. He locked me out in the, in the little apartment we had with one window and told me never to go out, because if I go out, they're going to discover that we are Jewish, they're going to kill us. So I was all the time living in fear, oh, I fear that they're going to discover I'm Jewish. But one day, somebody asked me to store something. He did not, could not answer it because he didn't know Albanian. So he asked me, what are you doing here? So we realized we might be discovered. So now, how do we, what do we do now? And my father was a very interesting guy. He was kicked out of school at the fourth grade. Why? Because he could not read, he could not write. So everybody thought that he is kind of uh, retarded. No, no, no. He was dyslexic. But at that time, they not what they know anything about dyslexics. And dyslexic people are very, very smart. They just have a problem. So he was trying to find out how do we get out of here? How do we get out of here? And this is a story which you should know because it's a very interesting story. In Albania, till today, but not as strong today, but 20 years ago it was still very, very, very prevalent. As of 20 years ago, 
they have a tradition that if somebody from my family killed somebody from your family, even by mistake, your family has an obligation to kill somebody from my family. Now that you killed somebody from my family, we have an obligation to kill somebody from your family. And this can go on for generations. When I was at work, 30 years ago, I was in Albania, the newspaper was written that 40,000 kids cannot leave their house because they're afraid they're going to be killed. But, aha, uh -huh, but, if you were escaping this vendetta, they have an obligation to hide you. So my father went to the leader of this Muslim, they're Muslims, they're Muslims, they're Muslims, to the leader of that Muslim community and told them that we are Muslims from Bosnia. And Bosnia is a lot of Muslims. And we are escaping a vendetta. Would he help us? So he said, I will take you to the mountains. And he took us to some place away on a hill somewhere up. And we came there, very primitive, no running water, forget electricity, you know. Uh, you do your needs outside there into some kind of a little hut. Very primitive. I have no money. Luck. Oh, my God helps. There was a wedding when they arrived. And all the hell, they all carry till today, by the way, guns, and they shoot in the air. And they were shooting in the air, and they hit somebody in the neck. But it did not really hit him, it just grained in his neck. Thank God. But he was hurt. So there were no doctors there. And it's a village somewhere, you know, very primitive, somewhere in the mountains there. My, dad, my father jumped the gun and says, I'm the doctor all the way. He, the the dyslexic guy who got kicked, kicked out of school at the fourth grade, could not read them, right? Became a doctor. He went there, he cleaned with the water, told him to sit in the sun, and that the sun would take care of it. He became a doctor of the village. It was a very interesting story. And now they were coming to him for help and bringing us eggs and chicken and food. And we started to survive. How in the hell did he succeed to perform being a doctor? God only knows. And, but something happened to him, that's why you will probably like to read my book. I don't know how many of you saw the movie, The River, The Bridges on the River Kwai, about the, the captain that they gave him an order to build the bridge, the Japanese, he forgot that he is a prisoner, and he was assisting to finish the bridge. That happened to my father. In the common language, pardon me, the expression is a little bit vulgar, it's called the peace went to his head. He forgot that he's a Jew, a fake Muslim, hiding in the mountains without any medical education. He believed he's a doctor now. And uh, he forgot, he forgot not anybody. And I won't tell you, it took risks which are unbelievable. I was going to do surgery in the guy. Unbelievable. And my mother was crying and begging, please, I had you, your, your profile, you're getting too famous. The, the Italians, the Italians were, were ruling Albania at that time. They're going to find out, and they're going to come to find out who is this doctor in the mountains, you know? A famous doctor in the mountains, they're going to discover us, they're going to kill us, stop it. He would not listen. The guy forgot who he is, he would not forget. And I was, we were also scared, so scared. To the point that I fainted one day, and I called it to my mother. Forty days and nights, I was screaming and screaming and screaming. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And uh, till today, I don't allow myself to faint. When I was in the Israeli army, they tried to make us faint to experience being unconscious. I said, put me in jail, I will not faint. Because if I faint, I was afraid I will never, ever wake up again. So there are all kinds of results with that war, which I will tell you in a second.
Учените не стигат това. Jews now from Bosnia, from Croatia, but were still left alive. 
a more than Teddy Lapid, the father of Yair Lapid, today that was Prime Minister of Israel. He was on the same boat with me. And we sailed to Israel December 48. Took two weeks to get to Israel because it was a boat. You won't believe it. They bought it for $50,000. That tells you how great the boat was. It was a junk boat. It was supposed to be decommissioned. But it was, they took whatever they could, the Israelis. They took that boat, did something with it, and we almost sank. We almost sank in the Aegean Sea. I remember that because two, two ships were circling us in case we sink to save us. But we arrived to Israel. 1948, long story short. When we left Albania, my father, the grandiose big doctor, did not tell them that we are Jews. He did not tell them that he's not a doctor. Mm. He kept it as a secret. But he told them, one day I'm going to come back and build you a well. So you don't have to go all the way to the river, which was one mile long, far away, to get the water, carry on the heads, all the way uphill to the village. That's how we lived for two years. We were, I will build you a well, so you don't have to go to the river anymore. We were in Israel. Albania was ruled by a real, real paranoid ruler. It was crazy. Proven clinically crazy because he was afraid that Albania is in danger and he built a bunker for every family of Albania. Every family in Albania had a bunker. Thousands of bunkers all over the place. Poverty galore, the most poor country in Europe. But they had bunkers for everybody. It was paranoid that the country was closed, nobody could get in. Fifteen years later, he died. The borders opened up. And I told my father, it's time to go and fulfill your promise. That's what the movie is about, and I recommend to you look at it. So my father said, okay. My wife had connection with Israeli television. Israeli television said, we want to document this. So we went to Skopje to my birthplace. We went to Monopole, to the concentration camp, and took pictures, and I took videos of it. That's why you will see that in the movie. And would you believe it? The same monks are still there. Nothing changed for 50 years. And I could identify where we were lying. I went to the window from which I saw my grandparents being put on the train and taken away. I remember everything. The fountain with the golden fish is still there. No golden fish though, but the fountain is still there. Still there. Then, I couldn't, I didn't remember exactly what the village is, you know. But my father had a name. Luckily, at that time, I was a consultant to the Prime Minister of Macedonia. So he called up the Prime Minister of Albania, they called me the Minister of the Interior, and found the village, found the people we were living, uh, we, were, we were staying with them. And we wanted to build the well. Now, during the war, we were staying with his family, two brothers, her wives. And they were very scary to me. Because if they find out that we are Jewish and we are fake Muslims, they might kill us. And at that time, you know, there was no police and nobody to cut your head off and throw you into the, into the river and nobody knows. I mean, there is no, there is no protection, there is nothing. And I just, you just, I hope that nothing happens, you know. During the Ramadan, I don't know how many of you know Ramadan, is when the Muslims do not eat during the day for 40 days. They eat only during the light. 
And they told them, my father became very courageous as a doctor. He was now the doctor of the village. He forgot who he was for so helping God. So he said, oh, I'm going to eat. I'm not going to go to eat. So me, the six-year-old kid by that time, I believe I was a seven, said, go to this first floor where the two brothers and the wives were, and they had a gun here and a knife here. I mean, they were always fully loaded with armaments, scared the hell out of me. Says, go upstairs. And, you know, if you hear me eating downstairs, jump on the wooden floor to make me know that I can be hurt, so I will stop eating. But if they catch us, they will kill us all. You hear me? You're irresponsible. That's why I was 40 days in coma, scared that I'm going to die. So here are these two brothers that I was killed. I was in, they're going to find out we are eating, they're going to kill us, you know, I was so scared of them. Now we're coming to see them for 50 years later, 1995, to build them a wealth. You will see this in the movie. I'm telling you all of this, so here I see those two brothers approaching us, they're old by that time, dragging their feet. And I'm shaking. I'm shaking. Oh my God. I mean, the memory is still there, you know. What's going to happen now? And my father and they're hugging each other, you know. And my father says, what is Philip? Died. What is this guy? Died. All the memories from 50 years ago. Then we sit to have lunch, and you'll see this in the movie. And my father starts singing Albanian songs, you know, very, and then the uh, director of the Israeli television asks us to Albanian brothers, did you know that he was a doctor? And the brother says, he was not a doctor. He was a doctor without a diploma. They knew all. And then let us be to save our life. They fed us. They kept our honor within those faiths and never told anybody they knew. So I know he's not a doctor. Then the director asked, did you know they were Jewish? He says, oh, I, we knew they were Jewish. They ate during the Ramadan. <laughs> And there was 40 days in coma, you don't know, she said that is bad. And oh, they saved our life. And about 10 Jewish families that was saved in Albania. Just this tw August 28th at the big event in the Pristina, co capital of Kosovo, to celebrate the Jews that were saved, the, the Albanians that saved the Jews. I just couldn't fly, I'm just too old to fly now, I don't want to fly anymore. But they sent him a video to thank the Albanian people for saving our lives. Let me summarize and then I will open for questions. My book, which you have up there if you like to see it, which I never intended to write, but just got away, happened, and I have to write it, more and correct it, more. Took 15 years to write it. I have three parts to it. First part is how I closed my heart. What happened in the camp? In the camp. How I saw my grandparents being taken and I closed my heart. The second part is how I built an enormous career. I don't know whether it was told to you who I am, but I have 28 books translated to 36 languages. I have 21 honorary doctorates. I consult to prime ministers all over the world, to major corporations in the world. I made an, an incredible career with a closed heart. All my energy went into my brain that I could not feel. And I was miserable. I was miserable. I get on a stage and I have thousands of people listening to me, applauding me, 
then I go to the hotel and cry. Clear heart. In your loves. My children tell me you don't love us. My first wife divorced me. You need to change. I cannot live like this. And miserable. Famous and miserable. When I made that decision, oh, I'm going to open my heart. I'm not going to die with a close heart. And I tried. I went through the third part of my book, how I opened my heart. So I went through all kinds of therapy. Nothing worked. All this talk therapy, you can talk, 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 talk. Nada. Little help. Then I met a shaman from Peru. I'm going to try. I tried anything. I would try anything. So open my heart. But none of the therapy worked. They tried all kinds of therapies. You know, breathing therapy and, and then hypnosis and talking therapy and oh my God, I tried everything. Nothing works. So the guy looks at me. And he says, your problem is you're afraid to die. It was absolutely right. What was I writing all these books about? Not to die. I didn't want to die. And he said, before you can love, you need to die. And if you die, to live. It to let go. Say, so how am I going to die? I don't even know where to die. How am I going to die? He says, you have to experience death. Oh my God. I won't tell you how I did it. I read the book. You say this is a good commercial. Yeah. Read the book. And I think I can tell you what happened. When I was lying there dead, he, he simulated death. The first time in my life I could feel. Because in order to feel, you have to stop to think. Because think undermines feeling. If you want to feel, stop thinking. Close your mind in order to open your heart. So I started, I could feel. And that was the beginning of me. Learning to love. And I'm happy to tell you now, I overcome the Second World War. It did not leave me with the terrible scars so many people carry. One of the problems we have in Israel, we don't treat the Palestinians with an open heart. There's going to be no peace until we open our heart. You cannot make peace with the brain. You make peace with the heart. But we, all Jewish people from the Second World, whether we realize it or not, suffer from a trauma. Our heart is still bleeding. Until we open our heart, we are doomed. Are we ready for questions? Any questions? Wait, the second part of my book, I have two books. One is the accordion plan because I played the accordion. And, and that was the only way I could feel, by the way. In all these years that I could not feel, the only time I could feel is when I played the accordion. I was a totally different person. People said, you're not the same person when you play the accordion. I would open my heart to music. The second book is called What Matters in Life. When this sub, okay. The first book, Accordion Player, subtitle. My journey from fear to love. How I open my heart. And this is good for all those people that suffer from your love. There is a way to love, guys. I would hope there is a way to love. So many of us are scared of love. 
And the second book is What Matters in Life. His subtitle is What Did I Learn from Opening My Heart? I learned a lot. Oh my God. Because with a closed heart, my eyes were looking inside, not outside. They were looking in the brain. My brain was very active, guys, very active. You don't get 21 honorary doctors for nothing. I mean, my brain was very active. But when they count, when they count this down, my eyes turned outside. Now I can see a lot of stuff. Now I can understand many things I didn't understand before. That's what the second book is about. What did I learn after opening my heart? So, any questions? How old was your father when he passed away? 1786. When I'm 86. So I already told my wife, be careful. Here I go. All right, so now. Yeah. Done. Next one, anybody? Wait, oh, sir. Right. Continue. Were, were you the old child? No. I had a sister born in 1947. Uh, because I was crying to my parents all the time. I want to have a sister or a brother. I don't want to be alone in the world because <clears throat> there is something. One of my favorite cousins, Moshe, Moshe, we were in the camp. He was my age. When the letters leave the camp, we were at the gate to leave the camp. He ran and caught my mother's skirt and was crying, Tia Duca, Tia means out. Tia Duca, my mother's man. Take me with you, take me with you, take, take, take me with you. So my father grabbed him and sent him back. And he was on the next train and he was born alive in the bank. My little castle. And when we asked our father, why did he do that? He said, because if the Bulgarians will find out that we are taking Saudi out of the camp without the passport, they might take our passports and punishment and send us back too. So we made a very difficult decision for us to survive. But I had nobody. My cousin died. All my cousins died. So I cried to my parents, I want to see, I want somebody, I want somebody. So finally I got a sister. In 1947, she's now in Israel. She's in Israel. So I have a sister. You know, can you have Amen and show that? Louder, louder. No, I can't. Louder. I'm sorry, how many children do you have? We have a bunch of kid kids. That's what I thought. I thought also about back to tap. You know, it isn't a new watch day now. How many children did you have? That's what I'm telling you. I have a bunch of kids. We have my wife, who was a widow, and she had a child from her husband who passed away. Then from her husband, husband from his own wife, and then from her own husband. So we have his, hers, from mine from first marriage, and ours. So we have six now. I mean, action. Well, so how many times were you married? Twice. Twice. My second wife is there. I owe her for opening my heart. Get up and do it. I want people to see you. Get up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, not, not too many women will leave a guy who says, do not say I love you. I would not say I love you. And she was suffering a lot. But she, she hung it. She hung it. I really, just, she deserves all the credit. Yes, ma'am. I should have brought my hearing if I forgot. How has the relationships changed with your children? I was like adult children. When you finally learned how to go up and in love, how did they change? Or did it? What changed then? The relationship between you and your children? Oh, yes, yes. It's very interesting. Uh, it, it, it just got, happened naturally. You know, we all stop said to each other how much we love each other. We actually say it. 
Many I love it. I yesterday my twenty man I was left from New York and she put the band hugging me and hugging me and says, Daddy, I love you, Daddy, I love you. And I tell I love you. We we are so open by telling each other we love just we say it a little bit. With all your heart, I mean it's natural to man. That's the little world they kiss. Oh very the love is all over the place. You know, you will see in my book is very interesting. She is a guy I did not believe in love all these years. I mean, I, I never, when I think about it, I, I really need to say therapy, no question about it. Because when people would tell me, talk about love, I said, I did not believe in it. Okay, then. And I didn't believe that somebody, not I could not love. And I didn't believe that anybody loves me. See, my wife would tell me, I love you, I say, thank you. I didn't believe it. Oh, yeah. oh she has an interest. Oh, what does she want? I was really sick, I'm telling you, really, that really was sick. Then, one day, I found out of a kidney failure. And I needed a transplant. 24 people volunteered to give me their kidney. It tells you how much I was loved. And I did not know it. I did not know it. Now I know it. If we do not develop the heart and rely only brain and muscle, Nazi Germany was not a fluke in the history of mankind. It was a preamble. What did Nazi Germany have? Lots of brain. They invented the normal the nuclear power. We stole it. They had the brain and they had power. No heart. Who can put until children on a fire, put gasoline and burn them? Who can? You have no heart. And if we replace our brains, and now we have a tremendous brain with artificial intelligence. We're getting more and more powerful, okay, with all the equipment that we are putting together. So we have power, nuclear bombs, hydrogen bombs, power and brain, but no heart. We are cooked as civilization. So it is important. I lecture all over the world that we train our leaders of business, of countries, to manage with the heart. Unfortunately, we teach them finance and marketing and production and human resources and accounting, nothing about hearts. They're dangerous. So it's time for us to start really working on opening the heart. That is what the future is, should be. Or we are doomed. We are doomed as a civilization. That's the question of when. Mm 